The scripture reading this morning is from Romans chapter 6, verse 20 to 23. Romans chapter 6, verse 20 to 23. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in relation to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you will derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome of eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is a story in the Old Testament about a valiant warrior, and this is a man who was a commander of a great military. Tens of thousands of soldiers would come, they would salute him, they would obey any command that he issued, they were under him and he was in charge. But there's something that happened to this man, he contracted a deadly disease. And there was a servant girl in his house that gave some instructions to his wife that there was a man of God in the land of Israel that could help him with his disease. And so he set about trying to find out how he could become healed from this. Do you know who we're talking about this morning? Yep, we're talking about Naaman. If you would, turn your Bible with me over to 2 Kings chapter 5. I'd like to read the text as we begin. We're just going to look at the first 14 verses and look at some points of application we can make from some of the mistakes that Naaman made. But before we do that, let's read the text and then we'll get into it. 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his master and highly respected because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man was also a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. Now the Arameans had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus spoke the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Aram said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. He departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothes. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, and now, as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? But consider now and see how he is seeking a quarrel against me. It happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes that he sent word to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. But Naaman was furious. And went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, far better or better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Then his servants came near and spoke to him, said, My father... Had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. 
Boy, there's a lot of good lessons that we could extrapolate out of this text, and surely when we get done, you could go back and find several more. And so this isn't really an exhaustive study of these 14 verses, by no means. But before we get into looking at some lessons we can learn and applications we can make from the life of Naaman specifically, I want to begin by setting the stage by looking at leprosy. And I believe God has given us quite an analogy in the Old Testament with leprosy. If you can consider leprosy with me for a minute, you may be able to appreciate and grow a little deeper in your hatred for sin. Leprosy is really a shadow effect of what sin is spiritually as to what leprosy will do to you physically. And if you can grasp how terrible it would be or how terrible it would have been for somebody to contract this disease, you'll see how terrible it would be for somebody who has sin in their life today. And so, but one of the greatest problems we face as we go about evangelizing and meeting people in the world and trying to put, reach out to them is people don't think that sin is that bad. Either that or they don't think they have any sin. And so don't judge me. And you're okay. I'm okay. We're all going to heaven. We're just going to go there from different angles on different paths. And so there's this philosophy that hinders progress in spreading the gospel. Because in spreading the gospel, you have to get people to realize how bad sin is. And that they are in sin, and they're enslaved to it. And that there's only one way to get out of it, which is Jesus Christ. And so, if we can get a grasp on leprosy, we can get a grasp on sin. You know, it's interesting that there's been this disease, or this, we should say, virus, I guess, this COVID-19, that has been prevalent for the last year, and people have been taking all kinds of precautions. I mean, it's serious business. You stay away from me. If somebody came in here and they were coughing and sneezing and hacking and we found out they had COVID, do you think we're going to be shaking hands and just giving hugs and how's you do? No, you need to go home. You're quarantined until you get this thing solved. And that's how it is. People have taken real precautions, some even more than others. I mean, you know, and I'm not knocking the precautions. You need to take precautions when there's something scary like that. But how much worse is sin than any kind of virus, any kind of plague or skin disease? Sin is a thousand times worse. We should be taking many more precautions when it comes to sin. But sadly, sin is often not really taken as that being very serious. So here are some points about leprosy and sin for you to consider this morning. Number one, think about the fact that leprosy destroys your flesh. It literally wreaks havoc upon the body. Once somebody got leprosy, there was a lot of things that went along with it. It was contagious. There was no cure that you were going to get from man's standpoint anyway. And it would start eating away at your skin. It would spread. It would, it would continue to take off your fingers, sometimes your toes. You can look images up on the internet of people who have had extreme cases of leprosy. It looks like something out of a horror movie. It doesn't even look real. It is terrible. And so leprosy would cause somebody to be ostracized from a congregation or from the society, you might say. They would have to be put out because they were considered to be unclean. And somebody who's unclean, and unless they found a cure and it was proved that they had dealt with that and the priest could then verify it, they were put out of the situation. And sin is even worse. Can you imagine? Sin is even worse. Jesus said this, Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. You know, leprosy would take your flesh, eat it up, and then leave you dying a lonely, painful death. But sin will take your soul and eat it up and leave you dying an eternal, painful death in hell. This is serious business, and we need to take it seriously. And I'm thankful that God has given us this picture of leprosy because it helps us. I think sometimes we can't really see sin. Somebody can be working out in the gym, eating plenty of healthy food. They can, you know, do their hair, put on their makeup, get dressed in some nice clothes. And, I mean, there's no real indication that there's anything wrong there. And on the inside, they may be just completely corroded with sin. Eat up with it. And so it is sort of a disguise in the situation. But it is a lot like leprosy in the effects that it has, but in a spiritual sense. Number two, leprosy cannot be healed by any earthly power. You know, it'd be terrible to discover that you had leprosy in those days. Can you imagine you're there in your room dressing or something and you notice on your arm there's something there? 
and you begin to, oh no, the same thing is going to happen to me that happened to those others that got put out, and you try to cover it up, you're wanting to hide it, you don't want it to be that, you don't want people to have to push you out, look at Leviticus chapter 14, and the next point we're going to back up to verse uh, chapter 13 in Leviticus, so don't leave Leviticus right away. Leviticus chapter 14, and whenever somebody was healed of leprosy, which God obviously anticipated, it wasn't going to come any, by any human cure, but God had prophets and God had means that some people were able to be cured from their leprosy. And there was a procedure that they had to go through before they could be officially declared clean once again and accepted back into society. When Jesus would heal lepers, he'd send them to the priest because they had to go through this procedure. Look at Leviticus 14, beginning verse 4. It says here, Then the priest shall give orders to take two live, clean birds, and cedar wood, and a scarlet string, and hyssop, for the one who is to be cleansed. And those are basically the ingredients for lye soap. So then he says, verse 5, The priest shall also give orders to slay the one bird in an earthenware vessel over running water, as for the live bird, he shall take it together with the cedar wood and the scarlet string and the hyssop and shall dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was slain over the running water. Or the margin says living water. He shall then sprinkle seven times the one who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the live bird go free over the open field. This is so fascinating if you've never seen this before because for him to be con uh, you know, declared clean, you had to have these two birds. And what happens with this leper is he's standing there with these two birds, and the priest is going to take one bird, and he's going to kill it, and he's going to drain the blood of that bird out into this running water. And then the water and blood mixture there is then he's going to take the live bird with the ingredients with lye soap and he's going to dip it down into the bloody water mixture of the dead bird and then he's going to lift it up and that bird's going to go free. He's going to sprinkle that guy seven times and say, you're clean. This is a great picture of what happens with us and Christ. We're like the two birds. Christ is one of them and we are the other one. And what happens is Christ is slain and his blood is drained out. And there is this, in a sense, bloody water mixture. Wherever you find water, we're commanded to be baptized into the death of Christ. As many of you have been baptized into Christ, you've been baptized into his death. And as much as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, you too should walk in newness of life. And so when you're plunged into that water, you're submerged into it, just like that bird was, and you're contacting the blood of Christ, and it's almost like the effects of a lye soap mixture for your soul. And you come up in a new life as a new creature, and you're set free from the bondage and chains of sin. There's a picture here, and then you're able to be declared clean. So sin is also uncurable, but it, can, it cannot be done with, with human hands. If you are looking for a cure for sin... You can't go to a doctor. You can't get a prescription. You're not going to have enough money to buy some you know, procedure for yourself. Sin is permanent, and it is incurable. The only way you get rid of it is from above. God has to give you the means for cleansing, and leprosy was the same, the same way. And so the Hebrews writer makes this clear, that you have, to, you have to become one with Christ. So in baptism is where we contact His blood, and we are able to be washed washed from sin and its effects on our soul. So that guilt can be cleansed away. Number three, leprosy has a very small beginning. Look back in Leviticus chapter 13. Chapter 13 and verse 2. When a man has on the skin of his body a swelling or a scab or a bright spot and it becomes an infection of leprosy on the skin of his body, then he shall be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of his sons, the priest. The priest shall look at the mark on the skin of the body. And if the hair and in the infection has turned white and the infection appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is an infection of leprosy. When the priest has looked at him, he shall pronounce him unclean. And so once this began, it started out as just a swelling or, or a scab or a little spot. And if it started to get a little bit bigger, they were to go immediately to the priest. This thing was to be looked at and investigated. As the investigation ensued, it was to see if it was deeper than just the skin's level. Is this something that's really taken some root here in your skin? And if so, 
They're pronounced unclean. And this leper is now going to be sent out from the community. He's no longer going to the temple to worship. He's no longer going over to the family's house to eat. He's no longer going to be invited to any of those social get-togethers. He is unclean, and whenever somebody approaches him, he's got to say, unclean, unclean, you can't come near me. And so leprosy starts small, but it then grows. I imagine there were probably some people, and this is just based on my imagination, but um, you know how sin works, uh, that when it starts, people probably try to keep that thing covered up, not wanting to face the reality of what they had to do. You know, how difficult that would have been to go show it to a priest, and then this thing's contagious. You could contaminate your family. And so eventually it became to the point you couldn't keep it hidden anymore. And sin is the same. It starts very small. Sin doesn't start with somebody just full-blown doing this or doing that. It starts with small compromises. We compromise a little bit with this, or we compromise a little bit with that, and before you know it, we're dabbling into deeper waters, and it becomes a bigger problem, and you're trying to hide it, and you're trying to cover it up, and you don't want anybody to know. Keep it in the dark, but sin eventually finds us out, doesn't it? Sin eventually spreads up the neck and to the face, and you can see it. It becomes very apparent that somebody is living in sin, and then it... it Usually at that point, it, it has a very deadly effect. Leprosy starts small, and if you, you know, even if you were to see it when it was small, it, it really doesn't matter. Sin, if, even if you sin once, you're still a slave of sin. And so thankfully, we have the blood of Christ. Number four, leprosy, it was regarded as a disgrace. And it didn't matter what your rank was. It didn't matter how much money you had. It didn't matter what family you were part of. It didn't matter what position you held in society. It didn't matter any of that. If you had leprosy, it immediately disgraced you in the eyes of everyone. You became unclean, and all of your status and any the situation you had going was immediately jeopardized. You know, sin is often welcomed in society today, much more than righteousness. In fact, we're living in a society today where righteousness is what's being castigated, and sin is what's being elevated. You could have a man who's living in adultery, and uh, who gambles and cusses and lies and cheats and steals, and yet, if he's good-looking and drives a really nice car and puts on a nice suit, I mean, people will say, man, this guy's something. And he'll, he'll keep his position in society because of that, regardless of the fact that he's morally a leper. And his actions and his lifestyle is basically telling everybody, I'm unclean. I'm not safe for you to come and spend a, a lot of time with and hang out with because, as we know, bad company corrupts good morals. Jesus ate with sinners, but not just to hang out with them and just to, you know, have a good time. He ate with them for a purpose. He was trying to affect them. He was trying to teach them. And he gave them an opportunity to do what was right. But a leper, a leper would not get the same treatment in society. It wouldn't matter how much they had going for themselves, economically, or with regard to their race, or their looks, or their status. They would be put out as unclean. Sin is a disgrace, and it endangers us, and it endangers others. It is highly contagious. It's just like leprosy. It's just like the virus, right? It's contagious. And something that's contagious can spread, just like leaven can spread, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So when leaven gets in among the lump, it spreads out. You think, well, it's this little leaven over here, I'm just going to leave it there. Well, guess what? that is going to have an effect. Whether you want it to or not, it will have an effect. And that is the way it is. So leaven will spread in a lump and it cannot be stopped. It's going to have some kind of an effect. And so it doesn't matter what you do, you will see it spread. Sin is going to do the same thing. Sin is contagious. And so we need to be alarmed by it. We need to be warned by it. We need to be aware of it in our lives as we examine our own lives first which is where we ought to start. Looking at, for the logs in our eyes before we ever gaze out among anybody else's life and take care of that which is wrong in my heart, in my life, before I begin looking for sin anywhere. But once I have taken that log out, Jesus says, then you can see clearly. And now you can help someone remove a speck. You know, the ultimate result of leprosy is death. You'll die if you get leprosy. Every leper knew his doom. If you got it and you were walking out of that city, you knew where you were headed. A lonely, painful, 
terrible death. And sin is the same. You will die. The wages of sin, as the scripture was capably read, the wages of sin is death. And that's not physical death. Everybody gets to die physically. It's a second death in a lake of fire where there's torment and smoke and the misery is eternal forever and ever, day and night. The worm does not die. The fire is not quenched. It is a terrible, terrible fate for sinners. And so no sinner who dies in their sins will go to heaven. That much from the Bible is completely clear. We've got to make sure we find the remedy for sin which God has given to us. And we need to make sure we access it. Now let's turn to Naaman and see what Naaman did when he was given an opportunity to have cleansing from his leprosy. And you can, based on what we've already said, start making some of the connections to our own cleansing from sin. So, some mistakes that Naaman made. Number one, I would just say this. Turn back to 2 Kings 5. Naaman was said to be a great man. Uh, great from the standpoint of, of being a, a somebody, you know, to, to many people. He was, he was an elevated man, a physician, and uh, status, captain of the entire Assyrian army. Uh, he, was, he was somebody. And yet, even great men make mistakes. Abraham, Moses, David... Uzziah, Hezekiah, uh, and Naaman is certainly no exception to that. James chapter 3 and verse 2 says we all stumble in many ways. And so mistakes are common to man. Uh, but if we're not careful, certain mistakes could cost us to compromise or lose our cleansing. Number one, Naaman thought he could buy his leprosy or buy his cleansing from leprosy. Look at 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 5. Behold, I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spoke to David my father, saying, Your son, whom I will... I'm in 1 Kings 5, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was like, this does not sound like what I was uh, you know, going over earlier. <laughs> Look at 2 Kings 5, 5. Then the king of Aram said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So here goes Naaman. He departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothes. Why is he bringing all of this? And I didn't do the math to figure out the modern day equivalency. I'm sorry about that, but it would have been a lot of money. And he was coming into the land expecting that he was going to unload this on whoever it was that was giving him the cleansing, and we're going to be even. And in fact, even after you get past verse 14, he returns after he's cleansed, and he tries to then say, Hey, take this blessing from me. And Elisha the prophet says, Not going to do it. Now his servant wanted it. Gehazi wanted it. And he went after and made provisions for himself. And ended up, uh, ended up in a bad way. You can keep reading that later. But in this situation, the prophet was not taking it. You know, that would be like somebody coming in here and, and wanting to know, Hey, I'm in, I'm in trouble with the Lord. I've sinned all my life. I'd love to know what I need to do. And we sit down and study the gospel with them and teach them what they need to do. And then they get baptized. After they come out of the baptistry, they pull out their checkbook and say, Hey, well, let me write you a check for a couple grand here. I appreciate what you've done for me. You know, you can't sell them the grace of God. To take money, if somebody did that, that would be as wrong as what Gehazi does as he goes after that money. You can't expect to sell God's grace, and yet televangelists, they seem to be quite good at it. And we see it all the time, you know. I, just mail in your check, and I'll send you a, another copy of the next lesson, or a prayer rug, as Jim said in class this morning, whatever it be. But none of that, or maybe it was Tom that said it, none of that will cleanse you from your sins. It doesn't matter how much money you have. You know, it doesn't matter how many church services you attend. It doesn't matter how many poor, little, innocent orphans you send money to feed. It doesn't matter how many mission trips you go on. None of that matters to get cleansing from sin. It won't work. And yet people believe somehow that enough good deeds, it's all going to balance out in the end. We're going to be square. My sins are going to be taken care of. Naaman had that thinking. is a fleshly thinking, but it won't work. Number two, Naaman went to the wrong place. Some people can go to the wrong place for a cleansing. Look at verses 2 through 5 here. It said the Arameans had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife and said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. This little girl had a soft heart and she cared about Naaman. Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus spoke the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Aram said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him his silver and gold and the clothes. 
So he's on his way now to the king of Israel. I guess one king thought, the, I'm going to send you to the, the king of the land over there, the highest in the land. That's where you need to go. That's where you're going to get this cleansing. And it really just was a problem with communication. If he told his king what the little girl said, the little girl said, go see the prophet. And he was not going to see a prophet. He was going to see the king of Israel, a man who didn't even have an audience with God. He didn't even have God's ear and couldn't have affected anything. Verse 6 and 7 says that he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, And now as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? But now, or consider now and see how he is making a quarrel against me. You know, it makes a big difference where you go to get a cleansing, doesn't it? They thought that they would send him to the biggest, most prominent place in the land. I mean, he was going to the palace where the king was sitting up on a throne in this big, huge room, and he was going to get his cleansing there. And some people have that same thinking, don't they? You've got to find the biggest building with the biggest statues and the, the biggest pulpit and all of this, and they've got the most money in the biggest situation, and that's where you're going to find a cleansing. God's certainly there. The Catholic churches, if you've been anywhere and been inside some of those, those things are massive. Mormon temples, probably even more exceptional. I don't know. Or even some churches right around the corner that just look like some massive thing that's been built. Surely there's got to be a cleansing in something like that. And that's what Naaman and the king thought. They just sent them right in there to the biggest place they could find, and there was no cleansing there. It was actually going to be a prophet off somewhere else. And you would least expect it to be where it really was. And so you've got to be looking for it if you're going to find it. Well, he was seeking it, and God made provisions for this man. And the prophet ended up finding out and sent word to the king and was able to intercept this situation before it got out of hand. But again, we see another thing about Naaman. Naaman had some expectations that weren't met. He had some expectations that just didn't seem to be settled. Look at verses 9 through 11. It says, Naaman came with his horses and his chariots, and stood at the doorway of the house of Elijah. Somebody important must be out there. There's horses and chariots out there. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. But Naaman was furious and went away and said, Behold, I thought. That's, that's probably not a good thing to say right there. That's a lot of people's downfall. Behold, I thought. He says, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. There is a way that seems right to a man, but it ends in death. And so he thought wrong was the point. And God's thoughts and God's ways are much higher than man's. And God had issued what he said. So his expectations was that this prophet was going to come out there, not send his messenger out there, the prophet himself needed to come out there and wave his hand and call on the name of his Lord and heal him. And that's not how it went down, was it? And he was furious. I mean, this, it wasn't like he was a little miffed. He was really upset about this. He's a somebody. He showed up with horses and chariots, and you're going to send out a servant to tell me something? That's not how we do things around where I'm from, and that's not what I expected you to do here. And yet, how many people come looking for truth or looking for salvation, and when their expectations aren't met, or they're not given that royal, you know, red carpet treatment maybe they were looking for, they just get upset and find fault with the way they were done, or the way things were done, or the way that nobody came and greeted me, nobody took me out to eat, and they're gone. Their expectations weren't met. That happens, doesn't it? Of course it does. Naaman had some expectations, and it almost costed him his cleansing. And today, the same thing is true. Many people have walked out based on some, some little thing that should have never kept them from salvation, but it does. Now, another thing, Naaman thought the prophet's instructions were really beneath him. If you look at verse 12, 
He goes on in his rage there, and he says, Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better? Aren't they better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. He was furious. He was enraged. I mean, this man was fit to be tied about the way this thing went down. Not just the way the message was delivered, but the method and how he was to go and receive his cleansing. He was upset about the whole thing. This was beneath him. Go wash in that dirty Jordan River? Don't you know there are rivers right over here that are much better than the Jordan River? And so he thought this was the way to go. He mentioned these two other rivers, and couldn't I just wash in there? And he went away mad. You know, when people hear a message that goes against what they think is, you know, it's, it's not good enough for me, they're either going to go away mad or they're going to go away sad. Really, the Bible gives us those two pictures, people that decide not to hear the message or fi follow the message, and they go away sad or they go away mad, don't they? And people still say similar things today when they hear the plan of salvation. It's just too narrow. That's just too foolish. There's got to be more to it than that. Wash in water? I don't need to get baptized. Repent of some sin? It's not... I, I'd rather do something else. And so they go looking for something else. Naaman went away in a rage, it says, is another point to make. He was told to dip seven times in the Jordan. And he was enraged by that. You know... How foolish is it to get upset about what God says? I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense, but people do it all the time. They hear God's word, and then they decide they're just going to get mad about it. They're so mad that you have said what God's word says. They say, don't judge me. They're going to take it out on you. You're going to know that they're mad. It's called persecution, right? You have said what God's standard is, and now you're the bad guy. Don't ever say God's standard to me again. Folks, that's persecution. That's what happens when we start speaking up about what God's law is. I'm not judging you. God said he's going to be the judge. I'm just telling you ahead of time because I care for you. And they are not happy about it. But it doesn't change their situation, does it? He could have went away in a rage and had nothing else been done. Would he have ever been cleansed? Sitting there in his beautiful chariot, probably wearing some of the best robes in his big situation there, and yet underneath all of it was a bunch of rotting flesh. He was still leper. And people today that get mad about the gospel, they get mad about repenting of some sin they have to repent about, or they're sad about it, it doesn't change it. They're still riddled with sin. They can cry, they can cuss, they can stomp their feet, they can yell. But it doesn't change their situation spiritually. Naaman wanted a substitute, is the last point I want to make here. He wanted to substitute some things. You notice he says these other two rivers. He wanted to have two different rivers than the one that was spoken by the prophet. And this is all too common. Had he gone to those rivers and dipped seven times, would he have been cleansed? Wouldn't have worked. He could have dipped 70 times. Still wouldn't have worked. Because it wasn't the instructions that God gave. And today there are many people who want to substitute what God has said in His Word for something else. They want to change it to the way they want it. Because that's just the way they want it. But it's not anywhere found in God's Word. They may speculate. They may try to make something up or try to reason and do some mental gymnastics with the Scriptures. But it's not there. And those were the old debate tactics. They'd say, we're going to sing, we're going to sing, we're going to sing. And he, I'll tell you what he's going to do. He's going to get up here. He's going to say this. He's going to say that. He's going to go here. He's going to go there. But he's not going to produce a verse in the New Testament that says we're going to use instruments. And they'd use that same tactic. Folks, people are doing that today. They want to substitute the Lord's one true church for all kinds of man-made churches. And they think that'll be fine. We can just go to any church. A man may have started this church and may have a creed book that established some of the laws and rules to govern this church. We can go there and it'll be fine. They want to substitute. Aren't these churches better? Because they've got more programs and a nicer building and a bigger facility and so on and so forth they might go. Aren't these rivers better? But are those the rivers that God spoke about? They are not. Some people today want to substitute the worship that God will accept and that God has authorized in His Word. And they want to bring in instruments instead of singing. God says He wants to hear singing hymns, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord, bringing forth the fruit of your lips. And they say, well, wouldn't a guitar and a drum set be better? Wouldn't a praise team be better? These would be better. In whose 
eyes are they better? Not in God's eyes. But they try to substitute and it won't work. You can praise God all you want with those things, but it'll never be accepted. They want to substitute sprinkling or pouring for immersion. God has given us the Greek word baptizo. We are to dip, to plunge, to submerge, to immerse. And they say, well, we'll just do a little sprinkling, rantizo. Not the same word, and they want to substitute God's plan. Or they substitute God's plan of salvation. Simply said, Jesus tells them they need to believe and be baptized and be saved. And they say, accept Jesus in your heart and say a sinner's prayer, and you can be cleansed from your sin. And they substitute over and over again. How foolish it is when we try to do the same. We end up sinning against God, and we end up not receiving the benefits that God has in mind for us. And so Naaman leaves in a rage, and he reasoned in his heart that this was foolish. What was it that cleansed Naaman? Well, his servants said, My father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? We need to be like his servants, don't we? Like Naaman's servants, when we see people who are going the wrong direction, we need to try to reason with them and say, hey, had God not told you to do such and such? Or try to persuade them. That's what they did. They were persuading Naaman to listen to God's word. And thankfully, he did. He yielded to those servants. They had a relationship, and so he was willing to hear them. And sometimes if you have a relationship with somebody, they may be willing to listen to you, and you can persuade them. And so Naaman decided to go and dip seven times in the Jordan. And in verse 14 it says, He went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. You know, the water had nothing to do with it. The lucky number seven wasn't the magic number. Even just sheer obedience, you can obey a lot of different messages. Sheer obedience in and of itself doesn't cleanse. It's hearing a message that comes from an inspired spokesman of God Almighty and then following it to a T. And if you do that, you'll receive the cleansing. And God could give us some great, huge task to go do. He could have been told to go conquer some army and go destroy some land, and then he would get a cleansing. But God simply said, wash and be clean. And God does the same for us today. It's simple. We need to believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and be baptized. And he says you'll be saved. We need to repent of our sins and be baptized, every one of us, for the forgiveness of them. And I know this is a less lesson on some fundamentals, but we need to hear fundamentals. We need to be reminded of these things. And there may even be somebody sitting in here this morning. You've not been baptized yet. You still haven't obeyed the gospel, but you've been thinking about it. And maybe it's been bothering you. You know you have sin on your account, and you don't want to meet God unprepared, and so you're thinking about doing it. Listen, this is a good day and a good opportunity. The day of salvation, the time of salvation is now. And Paul said, or Paul was told by Ananias, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If you're subject to this invitation this morning and you'd like to take advantage of the Lord's call to you, then uh, we want to invite you to come forward as we stand and sing.